First, we begin with an investigative article that's revealed a clandestine counterinsurgency program in Nigeria that's trying to lure militants away from the movement and from their goal of building a caliphate in West Africa. The report published by the New Humanitarian, a Geneva-based independent non-profit news agency with links to the United Nations, shows that former members of the Islamist militant group Boko Haram and its offshoot Iswa which is connected to the Islamic State group, are living in government-funded apartments in Nigeria, apparently free from the threat of prosecution. It's all part of a top-secret undercover project known as Sulhu, Arabic for peacemaking, to tempt militants back into normal life. Security officials believe Sulhu could open the door to a peace deal, ending a conflict that is now in its 12th year. But critics argue such a deal would only reward mass killers. Well, Obi Anyadike is the Africa editor for the New Humanitarian, the news agency that published that investigative article, and he joins me now from Johannesburg. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Anyadike, for uh, joining us there from Johannesburg. T tell us first of all about this project known as Sulhu, which you describe in your investigative article as clandestine. I mean, it's a sort of counterinsurgency project, is it? Yeah, I think that's, that describes it very well. It's essentially it's a peace deal with senior jihadist uh, commanders. Um, they cross over, uh, they swear to live in peace and renounce violence. Uh, and it's been used as a counterinsurgency strategy. Um, the idea then is that once they're back in Nigeria, they dissuade their former comrades in the bush to defect. And I mean, based on your assessment, because obviously you did a, a pretty thorough investigation, I actually read your article, I thought it was very well put together. I mean, how successful has this project Sulhu been in achieving what it was set up to achieve? Has it made good progress in drawing people away from the cause of the militants? It's difficult to gauge. I mean, around 150 have been through the program so far. Um, it seems to have had an impact in the sense that we now know that ISWAP is controlling uh, phone access, controlling movement, which suggests that there has had some kind of influence. Um, others would say that the people who are defecting uh, had a political problem within the ISWAP group, uh, differences with the previous leadership. Others are suggesting that they're escaping because they have committed crimes in the bush and it's easier for them to cross over defect and hand themselves over to the military. Um, so it's, it's, the test is going to be with the new ISWAP leader, uh, Abu Musab al-Banawi, if the same numbers of people defect, or if the program starts to slow down, that would be very telling. Well, yes, uh, but I mean, j just to be clear on what this is, um, in return for the blood that these people have on their hands and clearly the terrible crimes that they've committed, I mean, they're given government-funded apartments and according to your article, given a business license and given a monthly stipend. I mean, how pro problematic is that? I mean, to be clear, that's only a couple of people I spoke to. It's very difficult to get through to, to these guys. Um, but indeed, it's, it's a complex moral and strategic issue. I mean, the, at the end of the day, it's a kind of ends justifies the means approach. Uh, I think maybe some of the thinking is, is it not better to use these guys uh, rather than having them in the bush or rotting in Giwa? Uh, prison. So obviously the moral issue is, as you said, these guys have blood on their hands, almost certainly. These are senior commanders um, and they're not going through any uh, trial process. Um, that can be balanced with the issue that the, the, just, the justice system is so um, fraught, so problematic, um, has anybody been brought to trial throughout this 12 years of conflict? Do we have a judicial process that can really um, provide justice? 
And there's a, obviously there's a massive transitional justice issue within the Sulu agreement. These guys are meant to have done some kind of truth telling. There should have been some kind of reparations. There should have been some kind of mechanism where they can go to the people that they've harmed and seek forgiveness. But that hasn't happened. Um, in essence, these guys have melted into society, um, have kept hidden. Uh, and so the people who have suffered have received no justice. There has been no accountability. And I mean, that is precisely the worry, um, because I mean, having spoken to a number of defense analysts in, in Nigeria, exactly what you said now, the fact that there should have been transitional mechanisms, some form of reparations, uh, you know, but these guys are basically not being held to account for what they did. And as you said, they're simply melting into society. And to, to I mean, more alarming for ordinary Nigerians is that they don't know who these people are, although presumably the secret police does. I'm sure they do. I think they keep tabs on them. Um, I, I, I really want to make a difference between the Sulu program and the Operation Safe Corridor, because um, there's been a lot of pushback against Operation Safe Corridor, but a lot of the guys within that system are not, well, it's aimed at very low level uh, Boko Haram fighters, but the evidence is most of the guys within Operation Safe Corridor never held a gun. They were just picked up. Unfortunately, they were in the wrong place, wrong time. So that set that one aside. Um, Sulu is very different, but in both cases, there should be some kind of approach to the communities. Um, there needs to be some process where communities can accept them back, and at the very least, especially in something like Operation Safe Corridor, there needs to be proper mechanisms where the communities can, can be supported. I think what a lot of people kick against is that um, the guys who've gone through Operation Safe Corridor and in a sense the Sulu program have been set up in businesses, they've had some training, but the communities that have suffered, and, you know, we're talking about at least 9 million people, Nigerians in the Northeast have had their lives turned upside down. 4.4 million people are facing severe hunger. Two million people have been displaced. And yet, all those development schemes have done nothing for most people who are still struggling and suffering. So I think that's part of the problem, that whole moral debate about who comes first, who should be, who should be uh, helped. Um, but we have a strategic approach by DSS and the military, which is this, we need to find a smarter way to fight this war. Um, the kinetic, the, the, the traditional methods are not working. That's clear. We, at best, the conflict is stalemated. Uh, so I think what they're trying to find is a more intelligent approach. But without consultation, without bringing the communities on board, this seems, at the very least, most unfair. Well, absolutely. It certainly sounds that way. Um, I've spoken to a number of lawmakers in Nigeria, members of both the Senate and the House of Representatives, who say that every one of these militants should be prosecuted and punished for what they did, and that this would better serve as a deterrent than setting them up in relative luxury. On the other hand, I've also heard people making comparisons with the militants in the Niger Delta and the way that they were set up. I wonder what your analysis of that would be, having looked at the Sulhu program and being aware of what happened in the Niger Delta with the militants there. I think we have a, a, a habit in Nigeria of buying off people who are problematic. And I think the, the tendency then is you incentivize violence. Uh, we've seen that in the Delta to a certain degree. Um, it could also be happening in the Northwest. Um, this is slightly different in the sense you're dealing with an ideological foe. Um, it's, it's not a question of, of, of buying their support. Um, but I think clearly what we need to see is far more openness, far more discussion. The problem is that the conflict in the Northeast is veiled in such secrecy um, that it's very hard for there to be a transparent and open debate about these things. And clearly the, the, the degree of suffering um, means that 
the positions are very polarized and it's very difficult to start uh, an informed debate about this. But we do need to start somewhere. Um, and I think that the bottom line is, do we have a justice system that can handle this? I think first we need to ask some hard questions about what uh, has been wrong with a system where we have more than 2,500 people in Giwa. And I can guarantee many of them have absolutely nothing to do with Boko Haram or Iswa. We have a system which is unfortunately opaque and because of that process, uh, injustices happen. So I think we need to, yes, we need to talk about prosecution and we need to talk about, but on the other hand, we need to talk about a justice system that serves the country and serves uh, everybody equally. Um, and this is not just a Northeastern Nigeria problem. This is a problem in the, in the Southern states as well. Uh, we have some severe issues that need to be openly discussed um, and clarity sought. Uh, just uh, reasonably briefly, because we've got about a minute or so before we take a break. I mean, you talked there about the secrecy surrounding the program. Presumably, many Nigerians don't know about this counterinsurgency Sulhu project. Uh, it's not being discussed. Um, and I mean, you know, it, 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 it's clearly as a result of that, it, it's not accepted yet in Nigeria. I suppose it's a case of having to accept. Well, that's what I'm saying. I think there needs to be a debate and a discussion. Um, the, 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 I think the, the, the crucial argument or question is, do ends justify the means? Um, if we think, no, there's a moral issue at the heart of this around uh, justice, then that needs to be discussed. But if we think that these men are serving uh, security uh, service by uh, providing a, a, a security benefit, and this needs to be secret. That's uh, potentially that's an argument, um, but I do think that uh, when you hide things and you don't allow debate and you don't allow transparency, uh, some in injustices can occur and mistakes can happen, and nobody is out to account. Right. Okay. Please stay with us, uh, Mr. Anya DK. Would like to talk with you a little bit more. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with the Africa editor of the New Humanitarian, the news agency that published an investigative article into Nigeria's Sulhu counterinsurgency operation. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagulu. Now, you might have heard of the rash of surrenders by Islamist insurgents in Nigeria's northeast region, which the government has been hailing as a military victory. If you haven't, then read the new humanitarian. According to the independent news agency, which is based in Geneva, close watchers of the 12-year conflict say it marks the culmination of a power struggle within the jihadist movement and the start of a new and more dangerous phase. More than 1,000 Boko Haram fighters and their families have handed themselves over to army units in recent weeks, and hundreds more fighters have reportedly surrendered across the border in Cameroon. In return, the Nigerian government has been offering them accommodation, monthly stipends, and freedom from prosecution if they promise not to rejoin the movement, part of a controversial program known as Sulhu that may, many see as counterproductive. And Obi Anyadike, Africa editor for the New Humanitarian, the news agency that published that investigative article into the Sulhu counterinsurgency project, is still with me on the line from Johannesburg. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us. And, and in terms of the battle against terrorism generally in Nigeria, that which is uh, terrorism, you know, from from uh, Islamists in, in the north. Um, is it your sense that the government's position is strengthening or weakening in that fight? Or is it the militants who are getting stronger? I'd just like to back up a little bit about the recent rash of, of defections. Uh, that's not to do with Sulu. Um, that's much more, Sulu is much more about senior commanders within ISWAP who were part of a network maybe related to a former jihadist known as Mamanur, um, 
what's happening now is much more as a result of internal schisms within the jihadist movement, basically with the death of Shakao, um, Boko Haram commanders were given a choice, either join Iswa or face the consequences, uh, which basically meant they were going to be hunted down and killed. So what we're seeing is a surge of Boko Haram guys who don't want to be part of Iswa, um, and they can't reach a kind of a, a, the remaining Boko Haram outpost uh, around Lake Chad on the border with Niger. They can't reach that group. And so basically they're just surrendering. At least they know that their children can be looked after. So that's different from Sulu. Uh, yes, I, I believe their, their families will be catered for, but it's, and I, I suspect that they'll go through the Operation Safe Corridor program, but it's not the, the Sulu initiative. On the broader question of, of what's happening uh, on the military front, I think for the past few years, we've seen, sadly, um, the strengthening of ISWAP um, and the, the government's military position, at the very least, stalemated. Um, I think what people are potentially worried about is under the new um, Wali or governor of ISWAP, uh, al um we're starting to see, he's seen as young and charismatic, and we're starting to see jihadists from across West Africa, even Francophone uh, jihadists, crossing over, coming to rally by his standard, by his flag. And I suspect with the defeat of Shakao and the, the realignment of jihadist forces, uh, Iswap has managed to strengthen his position and Unfortunately, perhaps with the end of the rainy season, we might see uh, an even tougher fight on our hands. And uh, just tell us about the new humanitarian, the organization you, you work for, which carried out this investigation. I understand that it's an independent, non-profit news agency that focuses on humanitarian stories in, in regions that are underreported or ignored, and you used to be uh, part of the UN. Yeah, um, previously we were known as IRIN, as a part of the UN, um, but we broke away in 2014 and we're an independent non-profit uh, newsroom. Uh, basically, we try, we're try we reporting on humanitarian emergencies from the front lines of, of these crises, and Northeast Nigeria is one of the biggest. Um, as I said, Four, over 4 million people are facing severe hunger as a result of 12 years of conflict. More than 2 million people are displaced. And if we look in the wider region, Chad, Niger, Cameroon, the numbers are even worse. So we have a crisis on our hands in Northeast Nigeria. And that was my, and that's my interest in writing this particular story. Um, the conflict has gone on interminably. Uh, and this looked like an interesting element within that conflict, which has been unreported. Um, we do hope that, uh, you know, we can find a path to peace, but uh, right now the, the humanitarian crisis is all, all encompassing, all enveloping. Your, your central focus, uh, because I mean, you, you were part of the, the UN's uh, humanitarian um, coordination of humanitarian affairs office, and, and so your, your focus remains the humanitarian side, and you look at these military conflicts in the context of trying to resolve those humanitarian problems. R rather than resolving, what we're trying to do is provide um, analysis information uh, to help in the, in, the, in the humanitarian effort. But also, I think more importantly, I, for me, I want to report on, the, on, the, on, on peoples who are, who are bearing the brunt of these crises. I mean, it, historically or traditionally, we grew out of the UN and international humanitarian movement. But for me, my interest is in the people who are affected by these uh, terrible catastrophes. And so that means talking... Uh, being relevant to honouring the voices of people. And that, in a sense, is why, you know, this story for me was, was fascinating. You expect people who've suffered so much at the hands of, uh, of the jihadists um, to demand uh, justice. But what was striking was that 
after 12 years of war, a stalemate of conflict. People are just saying, let's find a way to end this. Yes, you know, these guys do terrible things, but if we can get a guarantee from them that they won't uh, resume their violence, if we can find a way to protect ourselves and be sure that the, you know, the, the, the government can provide the security that we need, let's find a way of living with them uh, and restarting our lives. I mean, you can imagine in these IDP camps, as people who have men and women who had businesses, who were independent, and now they're in a terrible dependency uh, where food is in short supply uh, and, and the conditions are dire. Uh, we've got about a minute and a half or so left to the chat. Uh, what, what sort of impact has the new humanitarian been having then with the sort of work that you're doing? I mean, is it leading to better decision making, accountability, which are some of the goals that uh, it aims to achieve? A lot of homework. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's what we're trying to do. We, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, this is a is a multi-billion dollar industry. The humanitarian industry is huge. And there is no real mechanism to hold it to account, to be accountable, to be responsible for how that money is spent, who is helped and who is not helped. Uh, so I think uh, part of our role is to examine, you know, even you know, the political economy of, 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 of aid uh, and try and better understand it. And also, as I said, to give a platform uh, hear, hear directly from the people affected, impacted by these crises. Uh, so it's not a top down and it's more a bottom up. Well, I, I want to thank you very much indeed uh, for the time you've taken to talk to us. Uh, Obi Anyadike is the Africa editor for the New Humanitarian, the news agency that published that investigative article into the Sulhu counterinsurgency project. And Mr. Anyadike was talking to me there on the line from Johannesburg. <music>